All right, Hafede and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for GBV's first webinar, A Moment to Help the Visitor Industry. My name is Josh Tikenko. I'll be your uh, moderator for today. Uh, today, uh, we want to go over some housekeeping rules uh, first before we start our program. So uh, first, everyone joining us, please shut off your cameras to maximize our bandwidth. Uh, we'll reserve the time for seeing our, our, our speakers as well as um, and some of our media partners later uh, when it's their time. Also, please uh, identify yourself before. All right, uh, you half a day and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for late, joining us for GBV's first yourself. webinar, A Moment to Help You're, the Visitor uh, Industry. Uh, My name is Josh Tikenko. I'll be your uh, moderator for today. Uh, today, uh, we want to go over some housekeeping rules uh, first before we start our program. So uh, first, everyone joining us, please shut off your cameras to maximize. Okay, so now that we're, we'll, uh, We'll, we'll get started. So today's uh, moment to help the visitor industry uh, is in collaboration with the Department of Labor, also with the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, and with the Guam Chamber of Commerce. So in this first hour of our first webinar, we'll be starting off with, um, let's, get, let's get queue up to the line of speakers that will be uh, will be uh, joining us in this first hour. So uh, the, we'll have remarks from the governor of Guam who will join us later in the program. Uh, we have the Honorable Senator Therese Terlahi, our committee uh, chairwoman uh, from the 35th Guam legislature. And also we'll hear updates from our GVB chairman, Sunny Atta uh, on the tourism industry, as well as we'll hear from our president and CEO, Ms. Pilar Laguanya on what GVB is doing locally and in the markets in preparation for reopening. Also, we have here with us today, the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association President, Mary Rhodes. We'll have an update from her. And also the Guam Chamber of Commerce President, Catherine Castro. And then in the second hour, we'll have our featured speaker, Department of Labor Director, Dave Delasola. He'll be talking about pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA, as well as the federal pandemic employment compensation and how employers and uh, self-employed individuals can take next steps regarding unemployment benefits. The last half hour will be spent in a Q&A session with our speakers. We've asked uh, uh, the community to submit their questions. Uh, we have some questions that were submitted in advance for our tourism voice box. Uh, so thank you to our research team for collecting those. So we'll be posing those questions to our speakers, but we'll also be monitoring our Facebook live feed. So if you have any comments for them, We'll be looking at that. And if we can't get your question answered today, we will compile everything and, and speak with our, our presenters to get those questions answered for you. Finally, we'll hear from our media partners that have joined us and we'll be doing a, a few rounds of questions and answers with them. And we're hoping to end this around 3 p.m. Sound good, everyone? All right, so let's get started. Our first speaker today that will be opening up our program is the Honorable Therese M. Terlahi. Senator of the 35th Guam Legislature and the Committee on Tourism Chair. So, Senator Terlahi, uh, you're up. Half a day. Thank you very much, Josh. And good afternoon, Governor and distinguished board members, executives of the visitor industry, and representatives from our business community who've taken the time to participate in today's webinar. As the Guam Visitors Bureau asks our international markets, to give us a moment, I want to thank the Bureau and all of you in the visitor industry for giving us a moment and your full cooperation as our government worked to battle the pandemic and to save lives. Every day, the health crisis demands families and businesses to dig deeper for fortitude, courage, and creativity, and to decide each day to renew ourselves in hope. I want to commend the Guam Visitor Visitors Bureau Board and their management, Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, the Guam Chamber of Commerce, forever looking forward, facilitating an expedient renewal of the visitor industry and all businesses based on good information and solid tools as will be provided today. I admit the revenue projections are alarming for Guam, but our challenges are not insurmountable. We already have smart, focused, proven industry leaders and workers who will need just a few more moments to implement the plans that they have laid out. 
aside from GVB's analysis of uh, a period of over 50% reduction in tourist attraction fund revenue, some national economists project a 30% contraction in real gross domestic product in the second quarter, negative year over year consumer price growth for five quarters, and an unemployment rate of 14% by the end of 2020, averaging 13% throughout 2021. But it is difficult to gauge how these numbers apply to Guam because this crisis has affected every sector of the global economy and our global supply chains, from medical supplies to food supplies. We have not yet fully conceptualized all the lasting changes to tourism and what standard practices will look like in the future. However, I'm confident that with the top tourism professionals led by GVB, along with GHRA and the Guam Chamber of Commerce and all member businesses, that best practices will be adopted and implemented industry-wide to protect our most precious resource, our beautiful island and her people. Today's webinar is a great start at helping our local businesses with solid information and tools to avail of federal aid. Guam Department of Labor has been working very hard to secure these benefits and set the programs up. And I look forward to the presentation by Mr. De La Sola today. I want to thank all of you who helped care for and house patients in isolation, travelers in quarantine, those who helped house military and federal disaster workers, who helped supply and feed our healthcare frontliners, food banks, and our Manumco, and who continue to help lift the community up in extremely challenging times. Many of you have been with us through other disasters and will be here for more. And you are pillars of our community because of that fortitude and that generosity. Together, we will keep our faith unwavering as we tackle our next challenge, not simply bringing businesses and employment back, but to ensure that we can empower businesses and employees to thrive as we rebuild. Enjoy the conference and Sidzu Ismasi. Thank you. Sidzu Ismasi, Senator Tralahi, and thank you for those remarks. Uh, we move on now to hear from our, our board chairman, Mr. Sunny Ada, to say a few words. Okay, can you hear, am I on? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Terlahi, for joining us today and, and for your, your words of um, encouragement and thanks. To all our GVB members and industry partners, half a day, and thank you for taking the time to connect with your Guam Visitors Bureau team this afternoon. The entire GVB organization has been hard at work since the very beginning of this unprecedented crisis. We have learned a lot and continue to learn more every day. A key focal point of the, of the Bureau has always been safety. So from the beginning stages of COVID-19 through today, our focus has been on safety, which is in line with the governor's overall priority of public health and safety for the island. The aggressive position of safety seems to be paying off as we are seeing relatively low numbers of COVID-19 positive cases. On the business side, we continue to gather data and assess the long-term impact this pandemic has inflicted on our island. The GVB Board of Directors has developed a coronavirus task force to mitigate the effects and address the concerns of the visitor industry. The task force is comprised of members of our board, GHRA, the airport, Guam Airport Authority, Guam Economic Development Authority, Guam Department of Labor, as well as members of GVB's management team. This group continuously monitors source markets, communicates with our overseas partners, and provides rel relevant and timely information to local industry stakeholders. We are committed to keeping the industry informed about developments that affect Guam's number one industry, and you will see that more so in the weeks and months ahead as we support the governor's plans for reopening Guam and ultimately rebuilding tourism and our economy in a safe and responsible manner. I'd like to thank the governor and her Guam recovery advisors for their roadmap to recovery, which was presented yesterday. I'd also like to thank again our oversight chairwoman, Senator Therese Terlahi, 
who has been in constant communication with, with the Bureau and has just introduced legislation to allow GVB access to the entire use of its rainy day funds for the Bureau's recovery efforts. Thank you, Senator. As a business owner, I share your concerns about opening our island and how to best reopen our stricken economy. I feel strongly that we must be committed to do, it, do this safely and responsibly. Certainly there will be challenges, but by working cooperatively, we can achieve new heights. We need to share resources and expertise so we can come through this crisis successfully. But let's be clear, there are and will be casualties. Let's also, let's also be on the lookout for opportunities. Your GVB team is here for you. As a destination, Guam has a hard-earned hard image as a safe and beautiful destination to visit and as a great place to live and work for our residents. So looking forward, we must work together to ensure this positioning remains well into the future. In closing, I'd like to recognize and thank the hardworking management and team at the Guam Visitors Bureau who have partnered with, these organiza with the organizations uh, contributing today, GHRA, Department of Labor, Guam Chamber of Commerce, to put together this afternoon's forum. And I want to thank my board of directors for their insight and their contribution of time in all efforts to, for recovery. So again, welcome to this, afternoon, to this afternoon's industry webinar. We hope you will find it insightful and more importantly, helpful. Please let us know how we can support you. Sijus Maasi, thank you all, and please take care. Sijus Maasi to our chairman. Before we go to our next speaker, I'd like to share with you all a very special video that our branding team put together that went viral last week. Um, so this is called Give Us a Moment. Sijus Maasi to our chairman. Before we go to our next speaker, I'd like to share with you all a very special video that our branding team put together that went viral last week. Um, so this is called Skip a Simone. Our island is asking everyone a very special video that our branding team put together that went viral last week. This is called Skip a Simone. Our island is asking everyone to be with our family. If I'm a Guante, our children, to be with our grandchildren, Itanota, our land, if I'm a Guante, our children, our thoughts, to be with our grandchildren, to be created. Our thoughts. Van Hongi. To have faith. To be created. To be with the things we know. Van Hongi. To have the things you've come to love. Give us a moment and we will share one together soon. Give us a moment and we will share one together soon.
All right, I apologize. There was a little bit of a, some technical difficulties. If you heard a uh, double echo, uh, we apologize. But the video is up live on all our social media channels for you to rewatch at your convenience. So next is our president and CEO, Ms. Pilar Laguanya, who will be saying some remarks. Uh, apologize again. We have a little bit of a technical difficulties in trying to get uh, Ms. Laguatnia on online right now, but um, she will be presenting. We also have uh, the governor. I think has will be joining us as well. So uh, please stand by for for her. Half a day and thank you for your time today and for allowing Guam Visitors Bureau the opportunity to share with you a little bit of positivity. As we navigate through the challenging times of our island history, our campaign asks visitors to give us a moment while we all come through the COVID-19 crisis. The Guam Visitors Bureau has had an opportunity to focus outward to support its local and international audiences by extending the half a day spirit while highlighting Guam's unique brand through user generated content and pre recorded video featured in the film you just saw called give us a moment. We want to thank Auntie Nadi for her voice in uh, creating this video safely from the comfort of her home. As approved by our board of directors, we are focused on three major source markets of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. We must rebuild our capacity in all sectors of the travel industry for Guam. We have two programs in the pre-recovery program and the actual recovery program. Our posts and responses on social media have been encouraging positive messages, messages of solidarity, and messages of support. Those posts and responses are now united under the umbrella of our program called Give Us a Moment. Now we all know that the world is consuming more content than ever before and quicker than we have ever imagined. And this is a great time to inspire and educate both our local residents and our future travelers. People will continue to engage in communicating with Guam as a destination and their desire to come to Guam once the pandemic is over. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, we must engage our local community. While the people of Guam know and understand the importance of tourism, we must alleviate all of our fears. We must continue to bring our people of Guam along the journey of healing and the willingness to welcome our visitors to Guam. It will be also important now more than ever that the industry and our community speaks with a united voice of what Guam is all about. Our island is rich with history, it's rich with our culture, and it's strong with our half a day spirits and the values of that. We encourage everyone to stay home, 
stay safe, and while doing so, to continue to share your Hoffa Day spirit and your favorite hashtag Guam moments. This leads me to our second goal, which is to inspire our future visitors. What a better way to inspire visitors to come to Guam than through unique and authentic perspectives from our island residents. This also encourages repeat visitors to share their hashtag Guam moments too. As the next phase of the campaign, a library of virtual experiences will also launch soon. By utilizing existing footage that we have here in GVB and our images, we are going to repackage and relaunch our library of materials. As people around the world are cooped up in their homes, we want to appeal to their five senses with existing GVB content. That will allow viewers to experience and to share Guam moments in the safety of their homes. So while we also seek out new content through our membership and our island residents to provide a mental or virtual vacation of Guam. As many individuals turn to social media, GVB has had an ongoing digital and social media communication strategy locally and overseas. These initiatives are led by Jason Lin and our crisis communication team that we have here in GVB. In addition to this, we continue to support our members through the posts of reshared and promotions that they have given us and shared with us. Behind the scenes, our Director of Global Marketing, Ms. Nadine Leon Guerrero and our hardworking staff are also working every week to share updates on what is happening in each of our core markets and where we are at with the development of their own recovery plans in our weekly industry reports. They have also done a really good job in maintaining communication with our major traditional and online travel agent partners. The time frame to get everyone up and running will be quite a process, and we want to be sure that Guam will be top of mind and when the time comes, we need to be ready. So one of the things we learned from this crisis is that we are stronger when we work together. We anticipate seeing more collaboration and efforts as we bring number, Guam's number one industry back. And when the time is right, businesses can rebuild and our workforce can get back to work. As Governor Lou Leon Guerrero announced plans to gradually and methodically reopen our island, Guam Visitors Bureau has been invited to participate in the Governor's Economic Advisory Panel to help prepare for the to help prepare and support our tourism industry's reopening plan. We all know that she signed a new executive order to extend the public health emergency to May 30th and to establish the pandemic condition of readiness or PCOR system as part of her recovery plan. Guam is currently in PCOR 1 and with the goal of reaching PCOR 2 eventually and hopefully very soon. By reopening tourism, we have another carefully, we, we will have an, to be very careful and uh, have a measurable approach and anticipate that this will fall within PCOR 3 phase of the reopening plan. It will require all of us to work very closely together, to communicate closely, and to support this integrated effort. We will share more details as to what this will mean for tourism and our industry as they become available in the weeks and months ahead. I just wanna assure you that we will continue to keep the health and safety of our residents as top priorities. Our communication team, led by our public information officer, Josh Tidenko, and our tourism industry relation officer, Nikisha Garrido, 
have been very busy even before this crisis began. With the support of our branding team, they have put together a number of different outreach efforts in order to keep our industry well informed. Every week, ladies and gentlemen, the team releases an industry update that provides insight into our key overseas markets and relevant information to our industry stakeholders. They have also worked hard to develop this webinar that you are currently part of today. Josh and Akisha also served at the Joint Information Center and the Emergency Operations Center for the first two weeks of this crisis at the offices of Homeland Security and Civil Defense. They continue to stay accessible and connected to our industry and our local government. Additionally, they have helped a unified outreach effort with Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, the Guam Chamber of Commerce, and the Guam Department of Labor. This initiative, called the Membership Outreach Movement, or better and fondly known by my staff, called MOM Program, is currently being led by our Director of Tourism Research, Nico Fujikawa, and his research team. So far, 250 businesses and employers have been contacted via phone or email by team members of our membership organizations so they can assist in two key phase areas implemented by the Government of Guam Department of Labor. The collective goal is to continue reaching out to the businesses daily so we can all help the 610 registered members from the Guam Visitors Bureau, the Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, and the Guam Chamber that may have been impacted by COVID-19. I also want to share that Guam Visitors Bureau is supporting community public safety efforts by continuing our Visitor Safety Officers Program in Tumon. The VSO has been actively patrolling Tumon's parks, beaches, and sidewalk to help enforce social distancing mandates and park closures. They have also additionally worked to help the police department to report any illegal or suspicious activities that they have observed in the area. Our cultural and heritage officer, D. Hernandez, and our cultural and heritage team are also working with cultural artists led by Joey Certeza to assist in making cloth ma face masks that are donated to frontline healthcare workers and stakeholders. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to uh, be, I would like to invite you to look at our free resources like our weekly industry reports and even my tourism column that we have weekly in the Pacific Daily News. Our website's repository can be found at guamvisitorsbureau.com or just find us on social media. I really would like to recognize also all the frontline COVID heroes as well as my GBB team for their hard work in making today possible. And to thank the governor of Guam, our Lieutenant Governor of Guam and our oversight chairwoman board of directors, our staff, our management team, our business partners, uh, especially Guam Hotel Restaurant Association, the Guam Chamber of Commerce, and the Department of Labor for today's webinar. Thank you and may we all be safe and recover soon. And now uh, we just got word that the governor of Guam has joined us. So I would like to introduce the Honorable Lulian Guerrero to give some remarks. Thank you, Josh. And thank you again, GVB and your staff and uh, people that have organized this webinar. I think this is a great way to keep in touch with our key stakeholders and even maybe uh, a forum and an avenue where we can also provide updates about our recovery and also about our um, progress with the containment of uh, coronavirus 19. 
We began this new decade with optimism and confidence in Guam's economy. We were collecting revenues beyond our adopted levels. Our tourism numbers were achieving record levels. And we were pursuing new industries for residents and non-residents like agriculture and cruise ships. But then we were faced with a challenge unlike we have ever seen before, one as impactful as a super typhoon, but much slower in its path. COVID-19 has changed our island, especially the tourism industry, not just here, but throughout the world. It has grounded airplanes, shut down hotels, and altered the dining experience. People are more cautious about where they go and who they see. And experts say it can take months to begin recovery. As has been said nationally, reopening Guam won't be like flipping a light switch. It will be like watching the sunrise. It will be slower than any of us want, but it will be measured and careful. Yesterday, I unveiled Chalan Parahinemlu, my administration's plan to responsibly reopen Guam's economy. This is a phased approach based on available medical data and our ability to manage future cases of COVID-19. We have seen the impacts of opening too early and too quickly, but we also understand the importance to begin preparing for our recovery and ensuring everyone is ready for when that day comes. Our recovery is in part dependent upon regaining people's trust to travel again after this pandemic. For the tourism industry to rebuild, we need to ensure two criteria are met. That visitors feel safe in Guam and our residents must be assured that visitors are not infected. This is the goal we are working towards our, towards our under Chalan Parahinamlu. Our tourism industry has taken hits before. We faced this in 1991 after Typhoon Omar, in 1997 and 1998 during the Asian financial crisis and after the Korean Airlines crash. In 2017, because of the North Korean uh, missile crisis, and each time we've come back stronger. For the duration of this public health emergency, I have asked the island to do what is necessary to protect our island. Our people have done and continue to do their part. And I ask the visitor industry to give us a moment to do what needs to be done for our long road to recovery. There will be difficulties and challenges along the way, but I remain optimistic and confident in our ability to come back, just as we always have. Thank you again for the opportunity to make some remarks and I wish you the best in the remainder of your webinar. I can't start my video. See, just Malasi, Governor, for those remarks. Um, I, now we're gonna go right back to our presenters. Uh, we have from the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, our president, Ms. Mary Rhodes. Half a day and buenas everybody. Thank you for tuning in to our webinar as we continue to give important updates for the tourism industry. GHRA has continued to remain steadfast as we lead the industry through various efforts together with the Guam Visitors Bureau. Uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, we started working with the Department of Public Health and Social Services and working primarily with Josh and Nikisha Garrido uh, in making sure that we give regular updates and have frequently asked questions on all of the different executive orders the governor has put together. Uh, we've also put together a couple of workshops and some press conferences so that we can continue to provide timely information and help businesses navigate through all of this. Uh, we've also worked together with Guam Chamber of Commerce and together with the Guam Visitors Bureau on the MOM project and we're very proud of that initiative and look forward to some of the information that the Director of Guam Department of Labor will be pr providing today. So we want to thank them for their continued partnership as we look at these federal programs and how we can help support our local people 
as they continue to navigate their way through all these challenges and also what it means for our employers as we continue to gather this important data. In working together with GBB and GHRA, we're very proud um, together uh, to present this information as we look really beyond the curve in a shifting landscape that we're continuing to see pre uh, present different challenges. But it is important that we start to identify what is this new normal that we have uh, providing here to us as we have a different set of operational guidelines and challenges in how we continue to operate with a pandemic that is a global issue. So with that in mind, I've put together some things uh, for everybody to consider that really goes around some of the engineering and administrative controls that you should start to really put into, into plan and implement at each of your workspaces. So as we are looking at preventing uh, a second wave and start implementing some of these controls and preventive measures, we look to reopen to the community and to the world as, as we start looking at areas where we can start identifying some of our key source markets and working together with GBB to begin promoting Guam. But first off, we as a community need to ensure that we are protecting our people first and our businesses are really implementing what they need to do to get through all of this. So some of the recommendations I've put together is to really start off with ensuring that you have employee education and training in mind. We have a lot that has uh, transpired over the last four months. And one of the things that we've continued to share through GHRA, and I really want to thank uh, GHRA staff in Danielle Ariola and Lena McDaniel, they have worked together with me through this entire period working from home and they continue to send out key information on what employee education and training programs you need to consider to keep your employees safe. So there are a lot of training programs to consider with OSHA hazard communication programs, bloodborne pathogen, and other, other things regarding personal protective equipment and what you need to do in the workplace as far as record retention and training records. You also need to consider updating your employee policies. Uh, if you don't have one, you should establish those so you could um, update the employee health program information to monitor absenteeism so that you can really identify whether or not employees need to get the assistance they need so that we don't have anyone entering into the workspace that might potentially be sick. Um, and so whatever the reasons are, they need to avoid being in any of our public areas and we need to update our policies. We also need to look at better ways of tracking this and documenting it as for any workplace injuries or any concerns with workers' compensation. Uh, employers need to prepare in identifying some of the hazards in their workspace. And so there's a general duty clause with OSHA so that we can identify areas where employees will not come in contact with any recognized hazards that are potentially uh, there in the workspace and do everything that uh, update to update our policies to ensure that we have regular cleaning procedures so that we can avoid any situation. So we also need to update crisis communications plans and emergency operations plans from lessons learned as we continue to work through the COVID-19 uh, in this pandemic. And then also businesses need to start really updating or reviewing their insurance policies, again, for general liability, but also workers' compensation and premise liability, especially since workers' compensation went through a recent change with the legislature. Uh, and I know a lot of employees are currently under the PUA might uh, still either be under employee leave or have been temporarily laid off or under furlough. So businesses need to start addressing that as well. On the next slide, I really want to stress that during these unprecedented, unprecedented times, it's important that we continue to work together, again, to navigate these undis, uh, uncharted waters as we continue to look at ways to go beyond the curve and look at how to improve operations and workplace safety. There's a lot to consider and we have shared a lot of inf information with the hotels and restaurants. 
Later today, together with this webinar, we will make available some of the National Restaurant Association and American Hotel Lodging Association recommendations for what they've put together for businesses in the tourism industry. But we are also encouraging other businesses to start sharing some of their best practices for retail optional tours um, and other businesses uh, where we need to consider that and share that with the economic advisory group. Some of these hotels and restaurants have really stood up during this COVID-19 pandemic. And we have continued to provide essential services for not just our local communities, but also our military and our tourist communities. Our hotels have served in providing up to 15 hotels with quarantine facilities for our local community, our tourists and our military partners, but also dozens of restaurants have continued to provide to-go um, to -go services as they look for ways to augment their operations so that they can remain in business and continue to employ people in a safe, in a safe way. But it's really important that, again, businesses look to this operations and workplace safety information that we've provided on this slide. For more detailed information, please look at the reference materials we've provided after today and click on the link on our GHRA website as well as our Facebook page for more detailed information. Some of those recommendations include updating your cleaning policy guidelines where CDC recommends to clean frequently touched surface areas and objects, especially that are from porous materials and also looking at non-porous areas. Also consider removing some of these materials from your public spaces so that you don't have to unnecessarily clean them. Look at spatial changes for public spaces and high traffic areas and how you can really implement, again, more engineering and administrative controls so that you're reducing exposure and any potential areas where the public may come in contact, but also your employees. You need to also reconsider some of the occupancy limits that are in there so we can ensure social distancing and also requiring masks, which we all have. So obviously there are different kinds of masks available out there, but we need to ensure that before entry, everybody needs to continue wearing their masks and also any other uh, um, any other requirements you need to have them uh, wear before entering your place. But these restrictions should also be considered for like shared items such as uh, things like in napkins or utensils or things that is a, on a self-service area. You need to start reconsidering some of the ways businesses have uh, customers access items in your service areas. So these are just some of the recommendations again for uh, not just common areas or public areas or high traffic areas, but also consider some of the soft goods that you have available for everybody to come in contact with, whether it's again, porous or non-porous materials, and then consider just some of the traffic areas for one-way directional traffic, such as entrance and exit areas, so that we can better help uh, communicate to the public how to navigate without coming into contact with each other, and really uh, implementing the social distancing guidelines that we are continuing to have and continue to have, especially when we reopen businesses. You should also consider partitions for receptionists as well as cashiers or anyone that comes in contact with public as they're starting to make transactions and complete their purchases on their way out. We should also consider uh, communal areas, again, like bathrooms where it could be single entry for the meantime um, as we continue to get through this uh, wave of this pandemic. So these are just some of the recommendations. Um, and going on to the next slide, again, we have some of the um, recommendations on our handout and some of the infection prevention measures are really outlined in detail for some of the key areas that people would come in contact with. So we, it is about prevention measures and what can we do to really implement some of these safety protocols in advance, communicate to their, our employees and get them all involved in how to make our workplace, but also our common areas safe for everybody. We also need to consider food safety and employee safety for back of the house operations as we look to interact and have uh, avoid having any cross contamination areas of how we handle things between uh, different departments. 
Public spaces in high contact areas, we need to consider rearranged tables and seating, and also again, removing self-serve items. It's all about removing vectors where people are constantly touching. I know that there's been a lot of information for um, fuel, uh, for gas stations about like public uh, area tenants for gas pumps, but also think about credit card machines, drink and ice machines, and even some of our air conditioning systems of how we can improve airflow and improve also add air cleaning technology in the future. Some of the soft goods management and inventory of how we protect that, such as some of the hotels could, if they don't already have uh, mattress pads or additional things that create layers for further protection in how we come in contact with porous um, contact with seats or cushions or covers. Also looking at additional cleaning and, and sanitizing schedules. Already, a lot of these businesses have um, policies and procedures of how they regularly clean bathrooms, public areas, as well as rooms and retail and restaurant areas. But we can probably do more with our checklist and start looking at more advanced technology uh, so we can not just clean and sanitize and disinfect, but really add in more deep cleaning in between processes. Again, with anything that we add to our administrative controls and engineering controls, we need to make sure we continue to communicate and train our employees. This is a very difficult time where we start adding in new procedures, new measures, but communication and train is absolutely key to ensure that you're not just adding technology, but also giving every employee an opportunity to understand why we're taking these safety measures also expecting that everybody also practice good hygiene and good personal hygiene during this time and ensuring that all employees are being monitored as they continue to access certain areas that we have uh, safety measures in place for both front of the house as well as back of the house, especially since we are in the service industry. So we've provided all of these guidelines from the National Restaurant Association and American Hotel Lodging Association. Um, some of the other things that they recommend, especially for businesses during a down period for shrunk businesses, is also pest control. Some of the things that we wouldn't normally consider, but we are publishing these guidelines to help augment or complement what the governor has put out in her four-part series for a phased-in plan. The next slide is about the um, core two when we get there to reopen these businesses, this is what businesses will need to start working on so that we can prepare everybody uh, when you need to submit information to the government when you're starting to reopen for business. Some of these key points are really important so that we can have transparency with the government, but also cooperation for compliance. And GHRA will continue to serve as your partner to make sure that we provide the necessary information uh, in order for our membership to understand how to understand the guidelines being put forth, but some of the information that we are offering, um, such as when we've gone through additional changes in the past, like the Guam Food Code, GHRA has partnered with the Public Health, Guam Department of Public Health and Social Services to educate the community when the Guam Food Code changes took effect. Also, when they put together new Responsible Alcohol Servers and Selling Act changes, we worked together with ABC Licensing Board. So GHRA has continued to serve your partner to advocate on your behalf and work through these government regulations as we continue to provide services to Guam, as well as to our tourists. And so it's very important that our membership continue to share information with us, but we represent and we service all of your needs during this critical time because really it's about going beyond this curve in a shifting landscape in order to really address all the services that you have forthcoming so that we can all be successful in partnering together so we can really be able to open up not just to our Guam residents and to our military communities, but eventually to our tourist communities that make up Guam. So thank you very much for your, day, your time today and we look forward to hearing from you. See, this is Mossy, Mary. I also want to point out that Mary is in our speaker chamber, so she is by herself in a room that will be completely sanitized uh, right after she is done exiting it. So uh, complying with uh, the governor's social distancing guidelines and isolation, uh, we're still keeping up with that. So she just Mossy to Mary. She, she gave a lot of information that is very useful to our industry. 
if you want this information, we will be take, uh, taking these handouts that they have provided and posting them online on our website repository at guamvisitorsbureau.com. Uh, we'll also uh, share her presentation with you there. So uh, we'll get that up in, uh, real, very soon, as soon as we're uh, going to end our webinar. So it's just again to Mary. And so uh, our next uh, speaker and presenter is no other than the president of the Guam Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Catherine Castro. So, so Kat, take it away. Half a day, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here, but I'm also cognizant of the time. So I will make this very, very brief. First of all, I want to thank the entire community for doing what you're doing so that we can get this far and start opening up our island. So continue what you're doing, your social distancing, your, your sanitation uh, protocols are working. So kudos to you and let's continue to do this together. Um, basically what I just wanted to um, let everybody know is that we are committed to our businesses, to our workforce, and to our families. And so, you know, how do we do this? We, you know, have been uh, communicating with the businesses um, more often than we have ever communicated previously. We have, um, in, the, in the time that we have heard about uh, COVID-19 in December, we have been tracking it very, very carefully. We were obviously concerned about how it would impact our shores. And uh, so we have continued to provide important information and resources uh, to the business community. And we were also um, provided uh, an, an, a really cool uh, uh, a notice that we call the chamber member roll call. Uh, we have had really, really positive feedback from that. And every day businesses contact us to provide us updated information to put on that member roll call. So, um, you know, kudos to uh, our, our business community and of course to the chamber uh, staff uh, for, for doing all of this, uh, Rebecca Delgado and Jacqueline Terlahi. And of course, you know, we wanted to thank our chairwoman, Christine Belletto, and our chamber board for just doing a magnificent job and helping us put together the um, our proposed economic uh, recovery plan that we uh, presented to the governor. So we really wanted to thank the governor and her team for uh, looking at our plan and, and implementing that and rolling that into the uh, eventual Chelen um, Parahinemlu. So uh, yeah, so thank you. And obviously, you know, we, the Chamber's advocacy role has been pretty well documented. You know, we're often in discussions with our government officials uh, about supporting business-friendly laws, requirements, and guidelines. In the past several weeks, our efforts were focused on keeping businesses open and keeping our workers employed. So our outreach has been focused on giving businesses a break on taxes and other fees in order uh, for the economy to get back on its feet. So um, we, we, we will continue to do that. Um, uh, so uh, senators, legislature, you know, uh, you're hearing from us and, and it'll continue because we wanna make sure that our businesses can be up and running and, and our economy can get back into shape. You know, we, we've provided a number of resources and I'm so glad to partner with GBB and of course, uh, uh, Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association. Uh, there, uh, Mary has outlined a number of uh, resources. The chamber has resources. Um, the women's chamber has resources. A lot of the nonprofit organizations have resources on their respective web pages. So I encourage uh, everybody to seek those out. Uh, and it's and it's great that we have uh, collaboratively worked together and we uh, support. Uh, all of these um, information. And so we're happy to do that and continue to do, to do that. At the end of the day, everyone, it's how our consumers feel, right? Do they feel safe? And, um, and I think if we, when we continue to work collaboratively as a community, we will get there. People will come out and people will support our economy again. 
So um, continue to do what you're doing. It will not be, we, it won't be business as normal. It will be a new normal. And, uh, but you know what, we're gonna, we're looking forward to that because maybe it'll pro at least at me i'm the positive person i think that is going to be better than it was before so thank you um i just wanted to be uh, really short and quick so that we can get onto the star of the show the, the, the department of labor i can have said it any better myself so Cesar masi catherine we appreciate your partnership and thank you so much again for being a big help and assisting everybody um it's great to work with you um, and see you from afar. Hope to see you in person when, someday soon. <laughs> so now, I know we're, we're now in the two o'clock hour and we are now gonna be featuring our guest speaker for this hour. Um, his name is David De La Sola. He's the director of the Guam Department of Labor. So we're gonna uh, have him present. And uh, we'll, after that, will be uh, the Q&A segment. So we have a, a bunch of questions that everyone has submitted. So um, we'll, we'll ask Dave to answer a bunch of them, but uh, let's, let's give him our time. So Dave. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to reach out and say thank you to GVB. I asked them to see if they could put me in front of their audience and they've of course exceeded my expectations by this large crowd. And uh, I enjoy uh, working with GVB and I continue to work with Mary Rhodes and we are trying to work and trying to figure out solutions to the during this pandemic. Uh, I did want to reach out to you guys directly. Uh, I, I know we've been doing a lot of this doing the through the media, but I know you have specific questions because all day long I answer questions from people's uh, from businesses who have my cell phone and I uh, entertain them and I give them uh, a lot of attention. So I, I did want to tell you that uh, if I don't get to all your questions, that Josh or uh, uh, will we'll collect all your questions and we, I will make sure that we answer them all directly because I'm sure there's just too many questions. And to this day, I talk to USDOL every day and I have a new set of questions on eligibility. And it's just astounding how much, how complicated this program is and uh, that I don't, and USDOL doesn't have all the solutions that we are working. And uh, I hope that I can give you some better awareness on this difficult program. Uh, I do want to say that, I, you know, I've had 15 years. They call me the disaster director because at the time I went with labor, I've done with Pong Song Wa, the, uh, the KL crash, the uh, earthquake, all the disasters seem to follow me. So I do have experience and I am ready and willing to roll up my sleeves and put together this billion dollar program that uh, as a USDOL uh, official said to me uh, last week that, quote, does your island understand that you're standing up an 80 year old program in a couple of months? And that's what this program is. It's a mini UI, unemployment insurance program that has all these intricacies that usually takes a year to stand up that I'm trying to do this in a couple months. And we are making record uh, headway. I know and I hear from not only my families to my friends to the island that they're all hurting and I am doing the best I can to get this program standing up and getting the money to you, but I'm gonna tell you the truth, and I know you don't like it, but it's USDOL that's holding me back. I'm running ahead of them. And I do wanna say, despite any uh, information you might hear, we are just as far ahead with the PUA program as anybody is in the states. There's only a half a dozen states that already have the PUA up, and those are with uh, up-to-date software UI programs that they can reprogram. The other states are having a difficult time and even reaching out to me, asking me who my vendor is so that they could uh, possibly entertain it and have them stand up their program. So I have a great staff at USDOL. I have Kat Pareto running the program with Helen Mothness and Greg Massey. And the governor has uh, provided uh, Ricky Hernandez and Stephanie Flores and Lynette Okada 
to help us stand up this massive program and we're running ahead of what USDOL is. And uh, so let me just get right into it with a quick executive summary. In the, there's so much information that I will try to condense it down to what you wanna hear. And there's two separate programs that essentially got approved. And one is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program or the PUA and the other one is the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program. And that program, the FPUC, is an added benefit to the PUA. And in the States, it's added benefit to the UI and to the PUA. So when you see that states are giving it out already, it's the FPUC is being attached to the unemployment insurance benefits that are have been going out. So uh, two weeks ago, um, the uh, USDOL told us that our weekly benefit amount will be 345 and that the, the uh, period is from January 27th to the end of December. That whatever uh, the t time that you were laid off, affected or reduced, you, you, that is when your program date will start and it will continue on from uh, 39 weeks from that date. And during that time, between April and July, the FPUC or the $600 will be added to that 345. And if you're still uh, eligible for the benefits after July, it'll go back down to 345. And uh, so the duration of the whole PUA program is 39 weeks whether it ha you were affected now or two, three weeks ago, or whether you're affected next month. Uh, the payments are retro back. So those who have been laid off will be receiving a very large check once approved and uh, we, check, we cut it. Um, I do wanna say that, and I'm trying to explain this as easy as possible for you all to understand. The FPUC is an added benefit to the PUA. So you have to receive at least $1 of the PUA amount, which is the 345, to get the $600. So just re try to remember that. Uh, so of course, there is a whole litany of who is eligible for the PUA. And essentially, I, I, I just wanted to tell you, that if you were adversely affected in your employment and in your income because of the COVID, then you are eligible for the PUA. There's a lot of other things that can, you know, but essentially that's what it's all about. So if you were working or you're reduced or you were laid off or uh, you were looking to be hired and you had a start date and they told you, I'm sorry, you're not gonna start because of the quarantine or because of the pandemic, you are qualified. There's a lot of facets to this and I don't wanna get into all the minutia of it. So um, I am trying to give you the quickest uh, broad view of it. And of course we can dive into those Q and A's that you have and try to keep them what you would think a lot of the employers will wanna hear. And I will try to get into some of these for you so that, um, that you can get a sense of this. So I, I, I did want to kind of, I'm flying very quickly because I know the Q and A is gonna probably last longer, especially when the media also is involved. So um, I will try to give you a little bit of a program update of where we are today. And uh, I know that is, the big question is when, of course, are we going to start ramping it up and giving out money? So I will get to that shortly, <laughs> give you something to stay with me for. Um, as you know, it was only just over a month ago that they passed this uh, monumental legislation. And within two days after they passed it, they sent us the agreement and the governor on that Sunday signed it and sent it back to USDOL and uh, that was for the APUA. And initially they said that the FPUC we weren't eligible for, 
because the eligibility requirements of the program didn't include Guam. And of course, you've heard that we fought it and fought it and uh, long story short, they decided to go ahead and give it to us. But to this date, they still haven't been able to draft up the agreement with language that the lawyers feel comfortable with. So that is what is really holding us up, is getting that agreement. Officially, nothing can start until both agreements are in place, but that's not holding us up. I want to thank the governor for fronting the money for me to start standing this program up in, in anticipation for those federal funds to come in. And we have been moving very rapidly and very hard, uh, believe it or not. Uh, I do want to tell you that, um, that we were able to hire a software vendor, the same vendor that, is, that does our hire Guam. This same vendor is also doing about seven states for their PUA and helping them stand it up. So we not only do we get somebody who already works with our module and the languages will, will talk to them, that the, he also has a proven product to USDOL so we don't have to try to sell it to them. They already know how to work with DOL. They've already proven. And since we've already worked with them, we were able to get it at a very, what I think is a good price, but also before we even had anything inked, they were already working on it while we were standing up this, uh, the procurements and the emergency things. They, this is a customized version. They basically took this huge statewide PUA, which is like a Ferrari and dumped it down to a Corolla so that we uh, don't need all that UI mixed in with it, that we just need that PUA module for it to work. And then of course, there's a uniqueness with the territories there. And that uniqueness uh, is the reason why we are being delayed in getting our program up and running. USDOL is trying to figure out how do we handle that uniqueness and give us guidance and give us information. That's why there hasn't been a lot of information out is because it's so unique that a lot of the information to, that the states are using are all intertwined with the UI program and it's hard to separate that out. Uh, I do wanna say that I'm not using any PowerPoints because all the information, fact sheets and some Q and A's are available from Josh and you can ask for that and look at that at your leisure. And uh, I have a team of people that are I'm also is currently developing additional PSAs and information and things that will be easy to follow and understand uh, as this program is working. So I do wanna say I have a lot of parallel uh, uh, things going on. First, the software is going on and being customized and being looked at. I know um, it was uh, about 10 days ago that I asked you guys to go to Hire Guam <coughs> and register. And the reason why I did that is because you need to put in, the employers need to put in that company name. And then from there, we need to verify that because of program integrity and auditing, that that is an actual company existing and operating on Guam. And then I told you to hang on to phase two. Well, phase two, I'm ready to announce will go live on Monday. So the, all those people that have established those and registered your accounts, Monday, please log on and enter those employees who have been affected. And uh, whether it's reduced hours, laid off or furloughed, start populating that and that would be the next step. And um, I want to thank you for your patience and ask you uh, in compliance to Executive Order 2020-7, mandating all employers to register and put in that information, to please comply. And also, I'm asking you to reach out to other employers and making sure that they get the message and apply. This tool, when I go my, when I put my online application on and these employees start putting in their information, that I have a way to dual verify that this 
uh, employee work for company XYZ, I can go to the employer module and see that employer XYZ, that that employee is work and that that per person was affected at the same date. So it's very important for auditing and for integrity that we have some of these uh, assurances put into place. And um, this will help us greatly to get this program up and running. That is what I, that was a big thing that I wanted to tell you today. Now where I'm gonna tell you is where we're at with the PUA program. The PUA program module itself is running very well and we constantly going back and forth. Now that this employer module, which is very basic and is not too robust. So going on to that and putting that information should be fairly simple. Um, it, it's uh, like I said, I haven't seen the final product yet because I'm telling them to put it on live for you Monday as soon as we can get it. I will hope to see it this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday and work with it to make sure that it, it's going to deliver what, it, what I promise. And uh, I'm working on very tight timelines so that I can get everything operating and we can help everybody as quickly as possible. Um, so the PUA program, we are hoping that I can get this up. I'm doing my best to do this by what the governor said, by middle in two to three weeks. That's what I'm hoping for. This is not with, a lot of these controls are not within my uh, uh, control. It's basically what the uh, program and the pro, you know, the, the nuances of customizing it. But uh, I feel comfortable enough to put my neck out there and tell you within two to three weeks, we're gonna stand it up. We are also working on a central processing center that's going to accept uh, in-person uh, call-ins and applications uh, on, you know, and put them all online. This whole process is like a UI process in the States. It's online. There isn't any States that I know of that accepts applications. The information is on a tree. So if you answer this or you check this box, it opens up this set of questions. If you're self-employed, you check that box, a slightly different type of application opens up than if you're just an employee. So uh, I'm trying to get them to develop an application, a paper one that I can give out so the people can at least fill out that will coincide uh, parallel with the online so that it would help us with the online application. They're trying to develop that. I don't have news to that yet. Uh, you know, I'm with software vendors every day talking to them and we're developing to see if we can get that done. But I will tell you the next big ask that, that will help not your employees and help, and help us out. And is that when we do stand up this online program that I'm asking the hotels, the businesses that have the capability to please set up a couple computer modules, the setups and provide the assistance either through your HR staff or whoever you have and call by appointment your employees in and guide them putting in their information and doing an online application and help them if they have any banking information. So if they have any, uh, if they can put in all the ABA and routing numbers and their accounts also in there, then that is the fastest way that I'm telling you I can get the money to you because the system software has the capability to vet and adjudicate you if you have all the necessary documents in place and that you self-certify by the perjury and by fraud of federal law that everything you say is true and correct, it will automatically adjudicate it and process it out so that I can give it to the vendor and they can either cut a check if you don't have EFT information or electronically transfer that retro check to you. That will happen 
fairly quickly. I mean, you have to remember, I am going to be accepting 38,000 applications. There's just no way that we can do that manually and accepting applications. The best way we can do it and help everybody is do it online. Be able to uh, help your employees use their resources, your computers, your scanners to upload all that information, to upload their layoff furlough letters, to upload a check stub, whatever it takes to uh, help them. And to those employees out there, because I know there are, 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 are companies who are closed and they can't, they're desperately trying to reach out to those employers to get those letters and they don't have it, keep trying. But if my online application is up and running, fill it out, get what you have and self-certify under perjury of law that you are putting in true and correct information and we will adjudicate it and get you that check and you will have to verify it subsequently. And if, if anything is found to be false, of course, I don't mean to scare it, but you could be, you know, of course, found in federal violation, you have to pay it back. It, depending on how egregious it is, you could also subsequently be in, in unable to receive other federal assistance like food stamps or housing or anything else if you are really egregious in, in falsifying your information. But put that aside is that online applications is the best and quickest way that I could get the money to you quickly. Now, I know there's gonna be a lot of people who don't have that opportunities and it's just gonna take longer because because of the quarantine, we're going to set up a processing center after the online application is up and running. Because once that online application is up and running, I have to train the 100 plus staff that I have detailed that we were able to get, thankfully from the governor, reaching out to all those directors, which please thank you directors, because we reached out and asked you for some of your most talented people, because we need that. Our island needs these people to be able to quickly understand how to run and operate and, and input the information as quickly as possible. So we ask for the cream of the crop. We ask for each agency to please, you're under quarantine, uh, try to survive for the next couple months while we pull these people in so they can help our people get into the system and get online and get their applications in and get to pay these people as quickly as possible. That's what the governor said is their priority. That's my priority. And we are working as hard as we can to run and do that. Now I need to step back for a second. I may be um, able to take online applications, but I can't give any money out until USDOL gives me the F Puck agreement. They haven't even given me that agreement yet. I'm not even supposed to submit at a budget, but I went ahead and gave it to them and said, as soon as this agreement comes from you guys, you have my budget, take it and approve it. So I'm running ahead of them. And, uh, but I can take applications in, I can vet them, I can get them queued for payment, but I can't do anything until USDOL gives me that agreement, sign it, get it to them. They look at my budget, they agree to it. I asked for $924 million to stand up this program and to pay all our people. That is almost the operating government, the budget for the government. This is the biggest program that I've ever seen. And um, I am, we we're ready, we're ready to move forward and get this out. But I'm telling you, I can't do this without USDOL. And I've been on them every day asking for that. And I can't be more passionate because I know you're hurting and I'm hurting because I have family that's out there. This is my island as much as yours. And I wanna help my people as much as anybody else. 
and I'm sacrificing my time every day, six days a week, uh, and doing this because I like to do this. I'm a public servant and I will do this for you. And I will do whatever I can. Uh, I have Jeffrey Stone, who is the way, regional appointment uh, uh, for OCII, the Office of Intergovernmental uh, uh, Affairs or something. He's putting me on a call next week with a group of people with the Secretary of Labor because he is appalled at, that USDOL hasn't been able to move our program forward. And um, I understand they're trying to stand up everybody, but an agreement is not too complicated. And to get our program loaded and, and when the states are moving forward, I just can't stomach it and I'm gonna work for it. And I probably shouldn't be saying all this stuff, but that's the way I am and that's the way I'm gonna tell you. So I am going to run ahead. I'm gonna accept applications. I'm gonna go ahead and approve it and they're gonna stay in queue and wait until USDOL um, is ready to give us that money and loads that money in. And as soon as that money is loaded, we're gonna slam those checks out. And there will be retro. So um, that uh, I, uh, I'm just going through here. So you kind of understand what that's going to be. The, the kinks, the program, as far as the central, uh, the processing center, I will divulge more information as we get some of these, the ink signed and, and uh, the agreements finished and we're moving far enough along where I feel comfortable to tell you how we're, and what we're going to do it, but it's already being stand up. It's already being put together and we are not waiting for anybody. And uh, I, I will get this program up and going before the end of this month. And if I get the money, I will be starting to pay before the end of this month. I, you know, I can tell you what I can tell you what's in my control and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm very passionate about it and I will keep trudging forward. Um, and thank you for your patience and, and waiting. I know people have been waiting for a month already since this program is out and, and other programs like the stimulus. And I know that it's, it's not Guam this time. It's not, it's, it's, it's the states that need to step up and move forward. And there's, uh, we are hate banging on those doors. So um, I'm reaching for, for those employees out there, get your information together, get your banking information together. If you don't have it, fine. What will happen is we will cut those checks and that we will mail them out. That's going to take a little bit more time. And um, I, I, I want to start ending as quickly as possible because I can just go on and on. As far as uh, I know a lot of people have questions and a lot of these questions have to do with the PPP program. How does that affect? Uh, so let me just get into that because that'll help cut down on some of the questions. And then uh, I will pick your, uh, your, your, your questions and I answer them. But remember, those employees that are affected by COVID-19, uh, COVID those are the ones that are, whether you're self-employed, whether you're an Amut or a Surahanu and, or a farmer or an artist or whoever you are, if you were making money and you had a living and that it was affected, you don't even have to be paying taxes. You just have to show somehow that you had an income and who you are and what you do is valid and I will approve you and I will get you that money. Uh, it may take you a little bit longer because I need to vet you out than the common person that had a full-time job and who was laid off is much easier to prove, but I will do that. The PPP program, those, uh, if you are an employee and you're getting paid PPP and you are getting, of course, your full salary, then you don't qualify for my program. If you are getting a reduced salary, and it's below 345, then you qualify for my program. If you are a worker who's reduced hours and those reduced hours are, uh, and your weekly income is below 345, then you would 
qualify for my program. If uh, now those three, the PPP, there's all kinds. If I have two jobs and I got laid off on both jobs, can I apply twice and get both? No, you cannot. Uh, how do I do this? In your online application, you have to list all your income. And of course, from that date that you were affected, you have to show during that week of if you had three jobs, out of those three jobs, did your income go below 345? If it did, you qualify for my program. If you were laid off on two jobs, you qualify for my program. If you got hired back and uh, you are part-time or reduced hours, as long as 345 is the magic number. You qualify for 345 uh, a weekly if you are laid off. If you reduced hours, you get the difference between your reduced hour minus 345. And as long as you're making $1 of the 345, you qualify for the 600 added benefit. So, I think I rambled on enough that uh, you got a good sense of everything you needed to know what we're afraid to ask. And I'm uh, willing to take it to you, Josh. I'm at uh, 235 and uh, I'm open up for any questions, of course, that you may have. Thank you very much for listening to me uh, go on. And I hope that you have a clear understanding. See, this Mossy, David, thank you for uh, all those insights. I just want to remind everyone that that was a lot of information, uh, but if you have any PUA related questions, I know there was a comment on, on our Facebook feed that said, uh, uh, well, that is pandemic unemployment assistance. So those questions can be sent to uh, Dave's PIO. Um, she's a really hard worker and I've known her for a very long time, Hannah Cho. Uh, her email is hannah.cho at DOL dot guam dot gov so um we, we, we can get that on the screen for you so again for any pool related questions uh send it to department of labor's pio the extraordinary hannah cho hannah dot cho at dol dot guam dot gov all right and now that's that time where we're going to go uh to our q a segment uh we had questions that were submitted to our tourism voice box and those questions were um compiled and, and given to us from our research department. So we'll go ahead and start off with the first question that was submitted from our industry participants. The first question uh, is directed towards um, DOL. The question is, how will you compute for the employees with reduced hours? And how about those with two jobs? One, she was furloughed. One, is she still working? So let's uh, go to Dave to, to get that answer. I kind of alluded to the, to the answer to that already. The online app uh, uh, software, you have to list out all your income. Uh, and of course, so you would list out both jobs and uh, you would basically tell the program automatically uh, vets it, that if you are laid off on one job and that you are still, but reduced hours on the second job that that reduced hours, if it's below 345, you qualify for my program. And so the one thing I want to tell you, there's only one amount if you're laid off, and that's 345 plus the 600 between, and let me make sure that you understand that, the 600 is an added benefit. It's a second program. Like I said, that program runs from April to the end of July, and that adds on to the FPUC which is a 39 week program. I know it's kind of hard because I'm throwing a lot of information out on you, but basically from, if you're laid off from April through the end of July, your weekly benefit is 945 a week. So anytime, every week, you have to re put in your information and re uh, get eligible for that week. And if, and in the pro software, you would log back on and you would simply put in whatever changes you have and the software will calculate it if you still qualify or not. Okay, thanks Dave. All right, the next question uh, that was submitted through our tourism voice box from our industry stakeholders is, if employees are receiving paychecks from the PPP, 
will they still be eligible for unemployment based on reduced hours? Okay, I guess that's me again. And uh, I'm trying to make sure that uh, it is kind of mixed. So if you're receiving PPP and you're getting your full paycheck, then you don't qualify for that period of time that you get the PPP. So if you get it for only two weeks and then you don't get any more, then you automatically uh, qualify for my program. So at any time, if you were laid off at March 20th and you don't receive anything, then all of a sudden you get rehired and you make money, but all of a sudden they let you go. You just keep putting in that information in the software. It will not qualify you for the period of time that you made over 345. But if you have a change that gets you below 345, that week you will be eligible again. That's the only way that we can handle this complicated of a program and, and changes employees that this software will do a lot for us automatically. Not everything, but uh, will handle a lot. So in the software, you put in all that information and it'll vet it for us. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay, next question. Um, and I believe this is also geared towards you, Dave, uh, is if we make use of the PPP slash SBA loan to pay our employees for eight weeks, can the employees apply for unemployment if our business still cannot open after the eight weeks? And I, I answered it, but I'll just repeat myself. Yes. You, any time between now and December, if you are affected at all, and your uh, income is affected and it's because of the COVID, then you can qualify for my program. So this program just doesn't stop and go away. And even though we may be back to condition four, but that business may not be ready to operate like a lot of the tourism related businesses, they're, they're gonna have a significant lag before they catch up before the airlines start flying in. So those employees that are still unemployed will still get this program for the 39 week period that they first qualify. And it, this program runs until the end of December, of course, unless Congress decides to do any extensions or anything. Okay, sounds great. Um, I know we have a few more questions that we will get to. Uh, we're not gonna answer everyone's questions uh, because of our time constraints, but uh, we will um, compile everything and get you all the answers and post it on our website repository. I know that we have our media partners also standing by for, for, their, for their questions to be asked of our presenters. So I'm gonna pose a, a couple more questions and then we'll get right into our media uh, partners. So this, this question was also submitted through our tourism voice box. The question is, when can we expect the module for employers to upload information about their displaced employees on the Hire Guam website? Do our employees need to log into Hire Guam individually in addition to their employer registering on the site? Um, I've answered it, but I will answer it again for you, is that Monday, the phase two goes live. And for those companies who did not register during the last two weeks, then what you're going to end up having to do is to register and wait until we of course validate you that you are a legitimate business and then you would go back in and enter all your employee information i can tell you to date that we have verified every business that has registered uh today so we're caught up my people i'm telling you i want to say thank you to my staff They've been working tirelessly between the 311 callers, the rapid response callers, to my PUA group, to the wage an hour, to the alien. They're still working nonstop. Some at home, some have been distancing themselves in their offices, and they're handling our needs as much as possible. And um, we're going to continue. So we're up to date. Monday, you start phase two. If you're not register, register and hopefully we can vet you within the day or two, and then you can go back and put in your employee information. 
Thank you, Dave. Okay, this is the last question that we'll we'll uh, ask. Uh, all the we had we had a few more questions that were asked, but um, we'll go ahead and talk um, with everyone offline to compile all the answers. So this this question is submitted by Jude Diaz from HR International Dining Concepts. Uh, he writes, "It is very difficult during this time to get answers from key players such as yourselves." With that said, for companies that may receive PPP funds to pay employees, is there any scenario where an employee can be eligible for any of the unemployment benefits if that same employee is, at the time being, paid under the PPP or even actual hours worked? If so, please explain in as much detail and with some examples. Uh, whew, that was a lot of questions. So. Um, if, if, if you haven't noticed, I'm on the media almost every other day, every day, and in the newspapers. I'm trying the best I can to get this information on this very complicated program. I, I haven't even touched the self-employed section. I haven't even touched a lot of the nuances on eligibility. This is a massively complicated program that is given to me. This is not my design. They gave it to me, and I'm doing the best that I can and I'm reaching out. I do have a team of people that are starting to develop this information, but remember, a lot of the information I give has to be vetted through USDOL. I just can't make information and give it to you and let it float out there and then wait for it to be vetted out. No, I have to vet it through the proper channels. So I'm doing the best that I can. I know it may not be the best and I apologize, but I am working on it as hard as I can. And the PPP program is, uh, the, 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 like I said already, if the PPP is designed so that you can pay your employees while they're out, and if they're being paid, and then of course they can't qualify. But though you may, you may not be able to pay them the whole time that you're closed. And as soon as that payment stops with the PPP, they would qualify. If you pay them an amount that was below 345 and they were full time, then of course they would qualify. But remember, I do want to say if they were only part time workers and they were making below 345 and you gave them their PPP payment and they were satisfied to what they were normally working and it's still below 345, they don't qualify because they're not adversely affected. They were back to where they were originally. And um, I know that just kind of messes up, but I just need to make sure you understand, you qualify if your income is adversely affected by the COVID. If you got another program or federal funds that are coming in and is, and is getting you back to where you were and you're not adversely affected, then typically you don't uh, qualify for my program. But if it's reduced pay and you're being paid below 345, then you do qualify because you're still adversely affected. Um, I can get into more of this at another time. And uh, I hope that you got the gist of the whole PPP and being adversely affected with your income and, uh, and the reduced hours enough to understand what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, and now we want to turn it over to our media partners who have been patiently waiting uh, to ask questions from our presenters. So we're going to do this in alphabetical order. And our first media partner will do um, a few rounds of questions with our presenters. So we'll start off with KUAM. I believe that's Nestor. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you, Nestor. Okay. Hi, Josh. Hi, Dave. Hi, Mary. Uh, did, did the governor, uh, is no longer online? Um, I believe, I'm no. not. No. She, she left. I'm looking through it. Okay. 
Um, so let me just move down then. Um, I guess this, this would go out to Pilar and to Sunny. Um, so um, how much money, I imagine you're going to need a lot. To, uh, how much money are you going to need to, um, for marketing once we do um, start reopening um, the tourism industry here? And um, typically that would come from the tourist attraction fund. And that comes from hotel occupancy tax, which obviously is not going to be very much. So how much money do you need and where do you plan on getting it? Uh, if I may, we've already identified about $2 million. One we've taken from the capital improvement projects. We re, um, um, we reappropriated about a million dollars from capital improvement projects that we had on in our budget. And then we have our rainy day fund that we've been saving for. And as I mentioned earlier, Senator Teresa Terlahi, our oversight uh, chair at the legislature, has introduced uh, legislation so that we can have um, the full amount at our disposal for recovery purposes. So far, we have about $2 million we're holding. How it's gonna be spent is, there, there's, not, there's nothing specific just yet. If I may add, Mr. Chairman, and hello, uh, half a day, Nestor. Um, one of the things that we are gonna to have to eventually do and we're still in the process is to work with our trade partners in trying to rebuild our visitor economy. So that number, that, that magic number you're asking for is not yet identified uh, other than the funds that we've been able to uh, uh, allocate within our own means today. Yeah, the, the two million doesn't sound like a whole lot. You probably need a lot, a lot more than that, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but uh, we are like uh, just focusing, focusing on what we currently have and our ability to uh, look within uh, and the uh, TAF um, situation. It uh, will require a lot, but we need to start thinking about uh, the future recovery of our visitor industry. So uh, we are working on plans and we are discussing with our partners uh, in our core markets of Korea, Japan, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, uh, what it's going to take when the time is right uh, to bring visitors back to our island. And, and Pilar, you've been through the, the previous um, emergency situations, probably none quite like this, but uh, when do you think realistically that we can anticipate the first arrivals? I'm sorry, I don't have a crystal ball. There's nothing quite like what we've been going through uh, today with the uh, COVID virus uh, situation. This is this magnitude is uh, uh, unthinkable. Uh, we wouldn't have thought about this a couple months ago, but uh, it is uh, here today. And uh, I wish we could see what the foreseeable foreseeable future is, uh, what I do know is that we will overcome this and it's uh, every day is so fluid and we're learning so much information and trying to manage that so that we can develop the next step moving forward. Uh, but I don't have a solid answer. It and, and and finally, yeah, sorry. Um, and, and finally, you can, I, I didn't want to hog all the questions, but um, for the, the hotels, for example, and other tourism businesses, is there going to be any sort of assistance for them? I know that, uh, for example, the hotels historically have had um, tax breaks um, to help them out, but um, is there any going to be any sort of uh, assistance, whatever it might be, um, to help out tourism-related uh, businesses uh, going forward? Um. I am only aware of the existing federal programs that have been announced. Um, I don't know if GHRA has uh, any insight to anything other than what uh, we have known publicly uh, through the government of Guam's announcements. Great. Thank you. Hi, Nestor. This is yeah. Mary. Hi, Mary. Uh, just so you know, we did actually, GHRA did pose that uh, inquiry to the governor when she made the announcement on her austerity measures. And so we did ask that in addition to uh, BPT, that we consider uh, delaying the hotel occupancy tax. Uh, we actually asked through the end of this year. 
Um, and so they said that at this time it wasn't going to be considered, but they understand that, you know, GHRA did request for that during the meeting when they made those austerity measures announcements. Okay, thank you, Nestor. Thanks, Josh. All right, next up we have the Marianas Business Journal, Guam Business Magazine. I believe that's Maureen. Yes, can you hear me? Buenas, everybody. Buenas, Maureen. So um, I would like to ask um, David de la Sola a couple of questions for the Business Journal. Uh, hi, David. Up a day. So here I am. Uh, my first question is, um, you talked about accepting 38,000 applications. Would that be for uh, unemployed individuals? And do you have any idea how many unemployed we have on the island or expect to have? And uh, what our unemployment rate will be? And then I have uh, a couple of other questions after that. Okay, if I got it right. No, uh, the 38,800 was uh, Gary Hiles, my chief economist looking at the employment report and doing a statistical analysis of it. Uh, of course, the um, unemployment is done, report is done by a survey, a statistical survey. And uh, we, when there's a quarantine in place, uh, we just don't have that tool. And of course the states utilize the UI as a tool for measuring unemployment, because if you're unemployed, you go directly to them and apply for assistance. So they have a live on, on demand uh, uh, site of what the, that number is. So I, I will tell you when we stand up this program and they all start to apply, uh, apply very quickly within a couple of weeks, we will have a very accurate idea of the layout of those displaced workers, laid off workers and reduced hours because the system will, will uh, will account for it. So the 38,800 was based on a statistical analysis and, you know, taking, you know, essentially a $50,000, I mean, 50,000 person workforce and looking at all the industries that are closed and uh, him coming up with that number. And that was acceptable to USDOL since we don't have any way of measuring it formally. Okay, thank you. I appreciate all the help that uh, we at the Journal have been getting from you and Gary and uh, Hannah. And then I wanted to ask, you referred to um, uh, $345 a week as the magic number. There are many, many people on Guam who, are, who will be earning more than $345 a week. And so do you know of any help for them, either that may be coming from the federal government or from the local government? Other than the stimulus check, um, you, know, you know Congress, they come up with very unique programs and you never know what is gonna come down the road. And like this program, this is a totally new, un, uh, imagine program that's so complex that is nothing like it before and that's why it's taken so long to get this program up but uh uh you know they gave me this program and i'm running with it uh whatever else comes down the pike from congress and the president is um you know you can imagine it could be anything but as it stands now there's nothing that i know of as far as with my program if you're making if your weekly income is above 345, that the PUA would come in and help you with. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I wanted to uh, ask the tourism industry um, representatives if they have any idea how many workers in the tourism industry specifically uh, are now uh, furloughed <laughs> or have had hours cut. I imagine it's a high number. Hi, Maureen. This is Mary. 
um, Jeffrey, hi, half a day. Uh, we had started this process at the beginning of the uh, executive order with regards to the quarantine and social isolation. So GHA started this about, I want to say, a uh, good almost two months now. And at that time when we were still having uh, Lena McDaniel call out to all of our members to collect this data, we had over 3,000 with reduction in hours. Um, and uh, I believe only 100 at that time was uh, furloughed. But since DOL has started the rapid response and with the phone number and with the uh, submitting the information through email, uh, what we've done is we've discontinued collecting that data, but just providing a community outreach. So I believe at the time the media was reporting uh, almost similar numbers be between what GHRA was reporting and what Guam DOL was collecting. And I believe Hannah was in an article uh, just a couple, like maybe three weeks ago, uh, where it was over 7,000 people have been impacted. But, you know, I, I have to caution that that data is only up until those time periods when we were collecting it. And so that's why the information with rapid response is really critical that everybody call in and start submitting their paperwork so that DOL can accurately correct, uh, collect the data and report this to the, uh, to the community. So GHRA, I want to say what we were reporting at that time was only true up until that time period. But um, we, we started that effort, but I know DOL has more up-to-date information. Okay, thank you. I'm going to mute and continue to listen in. I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to the next one. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, next up, we have Pacific Daily News. Uh, I believe Jarek is going to be representing them. Jarek? Hi, hi, Josh. Uh, this is Jarek with uh, PDM. Um, I had a question. Uh, um, I had a question for uh, Ms. Uh, David. Um, how many how many business businesses so far has has been verif verified? Um, David, for the on, on the website. Uh, that's an excellent question, and I should have gotten an update. I know there was, um, I, I will post that information and, and let it out. Uh, it, it changes so rapidly every day, and I'm just working on so many different things that um, I didn't get that information. I apologize. I should have gotten it. Good question, though, and I'll get it to you. Okay, no problem. Um, I had a question for Mary. Um, uh, Mary, what 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 are hotels? What do you think hotels are going to look like once um, you know they're going to be able to reopen? Like, what what kind of things people should expect? Like, with the social distancing and and um, the different kind of measures that we need to be in place. Like, what what would that look like for I guess people that are going um, when hotels open, like to brunch or to um, you know that kind of that sort of uh, situation. So I think it's important to note that in should the governor move everything to core two, there are certain businesses that will be allowed to reopen, uh, whether it's hotels, restaurants, or other kinds of service industry establishments. The hotels, though, we currently have 15 that are still being used for quarantine facilities. And so you have to really think about the time of occupancy in which this quarantine facility will continue to be in effect. And so that really, GHRA has about 28 active hotels. We don't include any of our non-members, which could be uh, the motels or the other types of uh, short-term, uh, long-term um, facilities that could be apartments or other types of um, structures. So with the legacy hotels, which have branding um, attached to it, whether it's off-island or local. Uh, those hotels, 13 of them are still not operational. Some of them are still accepting businesses, um, but they're not quarantine facilities. And so some of them are still actively um, taking care of tourists uh, who have been here for long-term stay or even military or contractors who are living here on Guam and working. Um, and also some residents who have chosen to be in the hotels. So we do have 13 hotels who are currently operating uh, outside of uh, different kinds of groups, but 15 of them are in quarantine. And all of the quarantine facilities have built in 
uh, whether it's 14 or 15 days for decontamination services. And so we have strict guidelines on how those will be um, sanitized and decontaminated before we reissue uh, those buildings back into the community. So we're taking all the safety measures uh, and protocols in place. And as I presented in um, with the information that I provided earlier, there are a lot of things to take into consideration with public spaces and contact areas that we have to put in additional uh, types of structures, if it be like the plexiglass that you've seen at the gas stations or the banks. Um, a lot of the businesses have to probably implement some of those things if they haven't already. So I think it's really important that businesses, that's why I wanted to uh, provide some takeaways today after today's webinar uh, to provide things to businesses to start considering of how to uh, just bring these into the workplace and to start establishing some safety guidelines, not just for the public, but also their employees. And so I think that's really important. Uh, you're going to see probably a lot of businesses just reconfigure their spaces to allow for different kinds of seatings to fall within the guidelines that uh, their occupancy rate would allow. So every establishment has occupancy limits identified by the Guam Fire Department. And so to, in order to have six feet of social distancing in all directions, you're going to have to really consider how much how many people can you really have seated in a in an area that would have only maybe 50 for occupancy or maybe up to 200 and so those configurations will all vary depending on the makeup of that facility itself so all the businesses will have to start um putting together some plans and that's why i believe um ghra is going to work together with Chamber of Commerce and also the Guam Visitors Bureau because we have to provide some recommendations even to the governor. And I'm on the advisory council uh, task force with um, David John and Ken Cook and that group uh, where we've already looked at different guidelines for the hotels, restaurants, um, golf courses, and other types of businesses. If they were to go into core two, how those businesses will need to adjust operating guidelines in order to uh, establish safe protocols and best practices so we could all learn together as we continue to uh, reopen businesses but also keep the public safe during this time and especially our industry employees. Thank you. Um, uh, I can, uh, that's all the questions I have for now. I can let the other media go. Thank you so much. But Jarek, I think it'll be important for you to reference to our handout. We have some mm -hmm. attachments to the links with the different guidelines and the recommendations for each type of department um, or operational area. So I think you'll get more information from those handouts. Okay, thank you so much, Mary. You're welcome, yes. thank you. Yes. All right, thank you, Jarek. Uh, next up, we have Pacific News Center, Kevin Kerrigan. Top of day, everybody, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes. We can hear you, Kevin. Thank you, Josh. I have a question for Sonny Atta. Um, the, the governor said yesterday that lifting the 14-day mandatory quarantine for arriving passengers would be the last restriction that she would lift. And I'm wondering if uh, the Guam Visitors Bureau has tried to change your mind on that. In particular, I'm wondering, wouldn't it be possible with thermal cameras and strict scrutiny of passengers on departure and arrival here, such as the, the proof we initially required a couple of months ago of negative testing, wouldn't it be possible to lift that enforcement of the 14-day quarantine sooner to make it more likely that we get more airlines and visitors coming to the island? You, you know, we're, we're really on the same page with the governor um, in terms of safety first, safety of the residents here, and, and safety of the visitor. So there is no push per se um, for, to expedite the, um, the uh, mandatory quarantine upon arrival uh, because there's, there's, and there's a separate, and, and th there's still discussion going on because it's not quite that simple. Even if they were to come to Guam, some of our, our source markets like Japan and Korea will require 14 day quarantine on the way back. For, from there for back to their own country. So there's a lot of moving parts here, Kevin. 
Um, I know that for, for sure May and June, we're not gonna see any tourists. Um, for sure, we'll need to understand when this 14 day mandatory quarantine will be lifted. And that will be a triggering point for the industry to, uh, to, uh, to pick up and understand when they can realistically be open for business. In the meantime, uh, in line with what Mary has been talking about is the island needs to be prepared and show that we have these new standard operating procedures that will assure our guests, residents and guests, that we are taking the uh, proper measures to mitigate or reduce the risk of, of transmitting the, the virus. Great, thank you. And I have one more question, if I could, of David De La Sola. Just to, to be clear about the, the PUA program, David, do, do we understand that individuals who were making more than roughly $8.50 an hour won't qualify for that additional 600 Is that the break, breakdown here? If you make more than $8.50 an hour, that you wouldn't be eligible for four? Is that what we understand you to have said? No, that's not what I said. Um, I'll try to say it again. Uh, the, the magic number is the 345 $345 weekly income. Now, if you are full time and you were uh, affected, uh, whether it's, if, of course, if you're laid off or furloughed, then you would get that whole dollar amount plus the FPUC during the, uh, the period that they both apply for. But if you are reduced hours, you have to be reduced and paid weekly less than 345 in order to qualify for uh, the PUA amount. So if you were reduced to 340 uh, on your weekly income, then you would qualify for $5 of the PUA, and then you would also qualify for the $600 of the FPOC, the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation. The law says, or the rules say, that you have to make at least $1 of the PUA amount, which is of the 345 to qualify for the $600. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Can I uh, interject one, one small thing? Is that uh, we, uh, I was earlier asked by PDN that we've so far vetted out uh, 600 companies uh, on the site, but recently we've been inundated with some more. So we've had uh, over a thousand uh, register. So we're now behind vetting, uh, verifying by uh, uh, several hundred. So we're gonna work on that this weekend. So over 600 are verified and registered uh, online. And we have over a thousand, 1400 that have registered total. So 600 have been vetted and we'll get to the rest of them uh, this weekend. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave. Okay, next up uh, is the Guam Daily Post. Half a day. Half a day, is Heidi? Yes, um, uh, yes, this is Heidi. Um, I have a question or questions uh, for Director De La Sola. First, what happens if the U.S. Department of Labor runs out of money by the time Guam, the Guam program um, is up? Well, uh, I asked that question directly to a fairly high senior um, U.S. DOL uh, official. And what he came back to me is that this legislation was passed and it was the monies as, as appropriated or as needed. There is no set dollar amount. So as the demand goes up and the dollars go up, they will appropriate accordingly. So he just told me that don't worry about it. it. There is no cap like the PPP or some of these other programs. It's as needed. That's all I can tell you. And that's pretty clear. Thank you. Um, next question. Are employers still required to continue health insurance and social security contributions to employees who were laid off or furloughed? 
as far as I know, well, social, those are all uh, not when they're laid off. But furloughed, it, it depends on the company if they want to so choose so. Some companies have continued on with your uh, medical uh, for as long as possible. Some have just laid off and it's essentially they've cut everything off. So it, it, it's not required. Um, next question. You said that you've got the, the agreement for the PUA. Will you implement that program ahead of FPUC? And will you cut the check, even if, even if you don't have the FPUC uh, agreement yet? I can't. I would love to, but uh, USDOL is accepting the budgets together and uh, they will appropriate it together and put the money together. So uh, although they're two separate programs, the I, I did, we had to break out the monies, but they will be approved all at once and then the money will be loaded and put in uh, in increments. So no matter whether they agree with my 924 request or, or not, they will probably, you know, give me like they did with the DUA program, you know, increments for, you know, they could give me 150 million and say, start drawing on that. And as you draw down on that, we will give you another increment as you get close to using it up. So um, that's how they've operated before. And based on my 15 plus years, that's how probably how they will operate again. Has there been, oh, thank you. Has there been any talks of using local funds first to pay out unemployment benefits and then just get reimbursement later? You know, that's been going around, but if you really yes. step back and look at the dollars that I'm talking about, we're talking $924 million. That's the whole operating budget of the government, practically. Nobody has that kind of money to start a program like this. It, there's, you know, 38,000 people. Where do you start with this? Um, the software package, it's coming. I'm hoping that they will uh, get me that money. The numbers are so huge that it is difficult to carve out an assistance. And remember, it's quite clear in the regs that this is in lieu of a unemployment assistance program. So if you have to be very careful if you are, you know, uh, and some of the uh, senators have talked about trying to do something like, oh, let's pay out some or a little bit, then you're standing up a UI program and they could jeopardize my program. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Heidi. All right, um, I think we just went through a, a great round of questions with our media partners and we also answered a lot of questions uh, from our, for those that have submitted from the tourism voice box. So I know there, there are more questions that were submitted, but we'll go ahead and, and, and meet with our, our partners to get that done. So just want to thank everyone that has joined us for our first webinar and also to our partners here today, the Guam Department of Labor, the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, and the Guam Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Masi to all of you, as well as to our GVB team for uh, doing this all uh, and making this happen. So um, if anything, uh, please go to our website at guamvisitorsbureau.com. We'll be posting up all the different takeaways from our presentations, from the handouts that Guam Department of Labor are developing, and also from Guam, Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association. Um, we'll be planning to do more of this and, uh, and, and try to get more speakers that are relevant to your needs and our industry. So again, Sizus Masi, and we hope you stay safe and healthy. And thank you again for joining us.